We're here at Yeshiva University Museum. I'm standing next to Lean Rittmeyer's model of the temple in Jerusalem. It is among the 12,000 objects that are housed here at the museum. And among these objects is a relatively modest looking sandstone tombstone coming from present day Jordan. It reflects the ways that the destruction of the temple and the traditions that existed here resonated for Jews across different communities in the world. To take us through this object and the traditions that are preserved and brought to life through this object, we have Dr. Stephen Fine, Professor of Jewish History and Director of the Yeshiva University Center for Israel Studies. Mikdash and memory, the temple and its remembrance. How do Jews remember this temple? How do they imagine it? How, after 2,000 years, is the memory kept alive? To understand this, we have to go back to the world immediately after the destruction of the temple, immediately after the year 70, when Jews developed the notion that remembering the temple, invoking the temple, bringing the temple into their lives would maintain the hope for redemption and its ultimate return. In 2012, I was reminded of this project of remembering when I received an email from Pastor Carl Morgan of the Woodland United Fellowship in Woodland, California. And attached to it was a series of photographs of an inscription from the fourth or fifth century, I thought. It was an inscription written in Aramaic, and the pastor thought that I might be able to read it and tell him what it was. Now, the truth is I could, because I'd seen a number of stones like this one, all of them from a place on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea, the southeastern shore, called in Hebrew, Soar, the city of palms, and in Greek, Zura, a city that during the Byzantine period, the late Roman period, was the very edge of the culture of the Holy Land, the place where, where pilgrims coming from the Arabian desert would stop on their way to Jerusalem, on their way to the rabbis in Galilee, Jews and Christians approaching the Holy Land. So I know exactly what I was looking at. And so I read this stone and brought it into class and asked my students, who were happened to be studying Talmudic archaeology that semester, to read it. Now, we created this relationship in reading it because the stone isn't easy. It has Aramaic script, but it's really smudged. It has images on it that aren't clear. And we were looking at photographs that weren't the best. The students wrote back and forth with Pastor Morgan, and we came to a reasonable interpretation. Let me tell you what we saw. What we're looking at is a stone written in a red ochre on which we see square Hebrew script, the kind that Jews used, but other people didn't use in this world. A kind of script that's used in writing the Torah for the Hebrew language and for its related spoken language Palestinian Jewish Aramaic. And so my students, who are pretty well trained in Talmud, could begin to make sense of it slowly but surely. Happily, there are 60 or 70 other published stones from this place, tombstones, that reflect the small Jewish community at the shores of the Dead Sea. And so we had some tools that we could use for understanding this stone. Now, you won't be surprised that my students were really excited. After all, we have stones from Torah that represent rabbis and women of all sorts and children and elders and even a person whose body was brought from Yemen and buried at the closest site within the Holy Land so that he would be in the land of Israel at the time of the redemption when the temple would be rebuilt. And so we began to read letter by letter piece by piece, what's written here. And you can see, Nafsha de Sarah Barat Pinchas. 
Now, that may sound easy when I read it to you, but it's not. Because if you look at the first word, almost all the letters are wiped out. Now, the second word, nafsha, it's easy to see a pay and a shin and a hay, so we could figure that one out. But what about her name, Sarah? Now, we thought originally it was Sada, because this little dalit over here is sort of like a race. Um, or this little race is like a solid, solid, actually. But we were wrong. This is how someone heard the name Sarah, which anyone who knows Hebrew knows is spelled with a sin and a resh and a hey, but as a Sarah. Samech, Aleph, Resh, hey. And now we know how they would have pronounced her name. Not as Sarah, as in modern Hebrew, not as Sora, as in a Yiddishized Hebrew, but as Sarah with that long ah under the aleph. The daughter of somebody who we took a long time to figure out what his name was, Pinchas. Sarah, the daughter of Pinchas, died on the 11th day of the month of Adar II, meaning a Jewish leap year. But here comes the interesting part. She died in year three of the sabbatical cycle. Now, sabbatical meaning the years of rest demanded by Scripture, where the land wouldn't be plowed and the land fruits wouldn't be harvested, where the land is allowed to stay fallow. She dies in the third year of the sabbatical cycle. And people actually live their lives by year one of the sabbatical, year two of the sabbatical, and over time they would of course, over the years, as we got closer to the sabbatical, save up food for that year. And it goes further. 360 years, le churban beit mikdasha, after the destruction of the temple, which puts us well into 429 of the common era. We know when she died. We know what day she died. We know a lot about what her family was thinking in burying poor Sarah, the daughter of Pinchas, with this little tiny stone in a cemetery on the border of the Holy Land in a place called Soar. Now, what else do we know? Well, the inscription goes on with a blessing. It says, may she rest in her grave. Shalom. Now, other stones say, may she be awakened or may he be awakened with the coming of the Messiah. This one is far more quiet. But it's going even further, because if you look at the bottom of the image, you can see within the frame a seven-branched menorah, represented, representational of the temple, representing the form given by God to its, his most unique artifact. Visually, the seven-branch lampstand is described in the Pentateuch. Um, more importantly, the seven-branch lampstand had become the branding element. If you wanted to show Jews with one symbol in the ancient world, the seven-branch menorah is what you did. It was the golden arches of Judaism in the ancient world. In other words, if you have even a little piece of this menorah, if you find just a little fragment of a menorah, you'll still always know that this is Israelites. Next to it, a squiggly little ram's horn, the clarion of the redemption. Next to that, a really squiggly palm frond. And to the other side, an image that my students went crazy with. They thought it was a square matzah because you see a square and has little dots across it. It looks like it was made, you know, in a factory. The problem, of course, is that Jews didn't make square matzah until the 19th century, the late 19th century. And so it's certainly not a square matzah. What it is is an incense shovel with incense on the body of the shovel. And we know that through lots of parallels. Again, the service of the temple, including the temple, the temple on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would do the service before God. And so we're looking at 
a theological document in stone, literally Judaism in stone, a little square rock that tells us about a poor woman who died, when she died, not how she died, but people died really young and often in childbirth, especially young women. A young woman, an older woman, who died, whose family counts the minutes of her death from the destruction of the temple, wishes her nothing but shalom in the world to come, a place that's envisioned in terms of the symbols of the temple of Jerusalem. Now, we finished this work, and we figured out the stone, and we called Pastor Morgan, who was overjoyed at what we found, and very quickly offered to donate this wonderful piece of Talmudic history to Yeshiva University. And so I went off to Woodland, California, to visit our friend Sara, to visit with the community there and bring this priceless object home to Yeshiva University. Now, is it worth a lot of money? It's not. It's priceless. This is one more piece of Jewish history living, quite literally, at Yeshiva. <laughs>